G'day, I'm Patrick from Douglas Fur Design. Welcome to the Router Bits. Recently picked up this box joint bit. Fantastic little router bit that helps you do uh, really common but very pretty and very strong joinery on mainly small timbers box work obviously it's called a box joint bit uh, so very common to do these little square 90 degree box joins but I'd also like to go through the process to building yourself a jig so you can do less traditional box joints like this uh, equilateral triangle or go through the process for even doing like eight sided shapes or five sided shapes and that sort of thing as well so really handy little bit and we'll just mainly go through the setup process today. I'm not gonna go into the full how to build the box, how to put the lid on and so forth, just showing you the joinery basics. Basically you've got five little blades, each one of them is four millimeters thick and the gaps are four millimeters thick as well so that the, the tongue and grooves of these little sections all join together perfectly. Now with five of these, this whole cutting uh, height is 36 millimeters, but you can actually uh, safely, I mean, the easiest height of join to cut is 40 millimeters on this without raising or changing the height of this cutter. So the reason for that is you've got these five teeth which add up to 36 millimeters, and then you want to leave the space for one additional tooth, which is that last four millimeters which brings it up to 40. The reason you want that last one on the top is because ideally when you have your two pieces and you join them together, you're gonna do one of your pieces uh, with the facing, you know, the top edge facing up. You can do the other piece with the top edge actually facing down and that allows you to join them together without altering the height of that bit just by flipping them over and getting them to match up perfectly. So that is no changing of the bit height, uh, only one pass for each cut. And that is the simplest way to use this bit, this uh, box joint bit. Now, if the uh, joint that you're trying to do is shorter than 40 millimeters, you're best off trying to make it a multiple of four and an even multiple of four. The reason you need it to be an even multiple is so that you have a male tooth on the bottom and a female notch at the top on each piece. The reason for that is because it allows you to do that thing where you pass one through the correct way up and one through upside down. If you want it to look a little bit more symmetrical so that you have you know, a male tooth on the top and a male tooth on the bottom, you can totally do that. It just means that when you're gonna uh, cut your matching piece, you're gonna have to raise or lower the bit by four millimeters so that you can create the corresponding section that has the female on the top and the female on the bottom. So that's totally fine, it's just a little bit more setup. That's just really up to you. You might be limited by the height of the box that you're trying to create, or you might really like that look of uh, a slightly more symmetrical join with the, uh, the teeth on the top and the bottom. So the first setup we're gonna do is on some timber which is exactly 40 mil wide so that we don't have to do multiple passes and raise or lower the bit. I will go through that stuff later on but right now we'll just do a really simple one. Put the bit in the machine and I've dropped it down so that the bottom edge of the lowest blade is perfectly flush with the table and that's gonna mean that our lowest notch is exactly four mil thick. If it's too high your notch will be wider than four mil, if it's too low, it'll be smaller. You need it to be precise. If you're doing a whole lot of stuff with really nice timber, it's worth doing a test cut. I'm gonna wing this with these, uh, I've got two sides and two ends of a little tiny box, and hopefully it's gonna work. So, I have actually labeled these with my four pieces that say top on the top and bottom on the bottom, and that's just gonna help me keep track of which direction I want to cut these in. Now, I have made a really simple jig which is going to help us do these uh, passes neatly and safely. Basically, all it is is a 
square piece of pine that I checked that was actually square, and that's, that's important. And then I put an additional piece of pine, I've just screwed it onto the end there. And then I've used some double-sided tape and put some fine sandpaper on this face. Now the fine sandpaper just means that when I clamp these little bits on there, they don't scoot around like they might do on just bare wood. So one more thing that you need to think about, which is that you really have to have material behind the pieces that you're cutting at the cutting face so that you don't get tear out. Now I've already done a couple of passes on here so you'll see that it's notched out and that's not gonna do what I need it to do because I need it to protect that timber. So I've just made another sacrificial piece of the same pine. I've stuck some more uh, sandpaper on there as well to stop it from scooting around. And then I will place that in front and clamp that whole business together with my material and that's going to protect those faces as I'm cutting. In terms of setting the depth of the fence, so we've already set the height of the bit, to set the uh, position of the fence, we want the cutting blades to be exposed uh, about the thickness of this material or definitely not less than. A little bit more than this material exposed past the fence is ideal. That means that your little uh, box joints have basically fingers that are exposed out the other side of that joint and you can sand them off. If the cut is less than, then you'll be left with little, little hollows that it's very difficult to fix. So, bring this forward, hold a piece of your stock on top of the blade and just rotate it until that tooth at its widest point from the fence is just exposed by Oh, less than half a mil. You just want to make sure that there's a bit of there's a bit more meat on those teeth than the thickness of this stock. And I can lock that off. Now with these bits, the thickness of your stock is limited by the depth of the of the uh, bearing that's set on this cutting head. At the moment, I think I could cut stock up to about 10 mil. I need to double check that. This stuff is closer to six mil, I believe. Uh, that was just the style of box that I was looking to make. It's seven mil. So I could make this a few millimeters thicker, but this is what I'm working with. If you want to do really wide boards, then you're going to have to cut all of these box joints by hand. You might see this little jig that I've made here and wonder, why aren't I not using the coping jig, which I've specifically made for this kind of purpose? And you absolutely can. If you, this is a little kit that we've put together. You can grab them from Timbercon. Uh, you just buy all these little components and sort of make it to the specification that perfectly suits your job. So if you were doing a whole bunch of box making, you could make one like this using the components that we supply to make a fantastic solid little box making jig that would just hold everything in place perfectly. My one was designed specifically to be used with a coping bit, which is a slightly smaller diameter than this box cutting bit. And what that would mean is that I was actually damaging this whole face of my coping jig. And so I wanna preserve this so I can continue to use it for coping type jobs. Uh, but like I said, if I was doing a whole bunch of box making, I would make one of these that was just the right diameter for this bit and then yeah, you could use that instead of this little apparatus which I'm using at the moment. So set the height, I've set the fence, I've got my pieces, I'm ready to cut. I need to clamp them in and need to make sure that you've got them uh, facing the correct way. So I've got my longer sides and my shorter ends. Uh, I want the, uh, I can actually do two of the sides together at the same time. In reality, you could actually do the sides and the ends all together so you'd have the sides with that top label facing up and the ends with the top label facing down. But you really run the risk of having them slide around a little bit. If there's any vibration or if any of them move, you're gonna wreck those joints. So I would stick with doing two, maybe unless you've done a whole bunch and you're confident that you can really jam them in there. I've also lowered the speed of my router so that it's not running at the highest speed. Again, and this is mainly to reduce the vibration. I just played with the speed setting until I found that that bit was sitting really nice and still while it was spinning, and that was about midway through the speed range. It's quite a large diameter bit. You're removing quite a lot of material, so that's also more suitable for a you know lower to mid speed. I'm holding my jig flat against the fence, 
I've got my additional sacrificial piece behind the pieces that I actually want to cut. Now I'm holding these all nice and tightly into the fence and then I'm going to clamp them down. Making sure that they're sitting really nice and flat and they're not going to move. Now you just pass it slowly and firmly across that bit. Uh, you need some firm pressure on it because if you have any up and down vibration, those notches are going to be too wide and the joint's going to be a little bit loose. So uh, you can get a really nice tight joint if you just keep everything really nice and still. This is all well and good if you're creating a box which is really shallow or a tray or something like that. But often you'll be wanting to create something which is deeper than the bit will allow you to do in one pass. It's not terribly complicated, there are a couple of ways to do it. Uh, you're still limited in height uh, by a few factors. So the simplest way to think about it is the bit allows you to cut 40 mil in one pass. So if you do one pass If you do one pass the correct way up and then you flip it over and do the other pass uh, upside down, you can get something up to 80 millimeters wide. If you really want to push it, you can get up to about 100 and the way that you do that is you'll do your first pass, you'll raise the bit up to its full height, which in my case is about an additional centimeter, and then you'll do another pass and then you'll flip it upside down, bring the bit down to its lowest point and then bring it up that additional centimeter. And that's how you get to something about 100 millimeters wide. Now, that's totally acceptable and doable with this bit. The only issue is that every time you move it, you allow the possibility of inaccuracy into your cuts. So when you're cutting over uh, trenches, trenches that you've already cut, if you have not set the height exactly correctly, you're gonna make those trenches slightly wider, which is gonna make your fit a little bit wobbly. Uh, there's also the thing to consider when you flip it upside down that you're no longer you're going to have a symmetrical top and bottom so you need to size your panels accordingly and then you'll have to uh, move the height of the bit to do the corresponding ends because you're going to have a symmetrical uh, pattern with instead of having male on one end and sorry male on both ends you're going to have to have female on both ends and that's going to requ require you to raise that bit by four millimeters. So with anything like this, as I always say, I would do a test cut. When I was messing around with this, the first little box uh, that I did try to put together using the flipping over method, I hadn't quite set the height as accurately as I should have. And I'm left with this um, little tiny gap in the center of these teeth. And that gap is caused by my bit being less than a millimeter too high when I reset it. Uh, so overall, I mean, you can still glue this together. It's a nice tight join, but there's that little tiny gap. I can see it. You might not be able to see it after you glue it and sand it, but I would always know it's there. So it's worth doing a test cut, making sure it is accurate and you know how to set the height correctly. And then you can get a really nice tight join that's higher than the depth of that bit will allow you to do in one pass. Okay, to further clarify this uh, double depth cutting uh, method. I want to show you with these bits that I've already cut. So I have my sides and my ends and I've placed the sides with the top edge facing up and the ends with the top edge facing down so that I can do corresponding cuts that when flipped will match and form that join just as I did with the small one which I'm throwing around everywhere. So you can imagine that I did now I didn't actually do all of these together, but the cuts are all identical. So I'm just demonstrating this way. I did that cut first on that end, and then I flipped the whole thing around and did the same corresponding cut on the other end. And so what that left me with was uh, all four pieces had half of the cuts done 
which when flipped would match up. Now I'm ready to do the uncut edge, which means I need to flip these over vertically, but I can't just put these on the cutter. I need to actually raise it up by four mil to get those teeth to match the existing holes. And so the way that I do that is actually by using one of the pieces that I already have cut to match up the teeth height exactly with the hole that I need to cut. So I'm gonna loosen this off now and raise that up so you can see what that looks like. Right now, if I run this through, the, uh, the teeth of the blade would be cutting my teeth on my timber away. And I want the teeth of the blade to be matching up with the notches, not the teeth on my timber. I hope that makes sense. It should if, you, if you're looking at it here. Okay, so right now, those teeth are lined up with my little male timber components and I'm just gonna raise or lower, either way it doesn't matter, I'm actually, I'll lower it in this case by exactly four millimeters. And the way I'm gonna line that up is just visually by seeing the way those teeth line up with the holes. Now, in this case, because I've already cut all of these, I can actually match up all of these little teeth notches. But in your case, you'll only have done half, so you'll only be able to match up one of them, which will be the center one. Either way, you'll still get an accurate reading, it should just slide in there perfectly without any rubbing and that's the way that you set the height correctly. So these are a really handy little bit. It makes really strong joins that I think look fantastic as well. Um, you're just gonna have to play around with it to make sure that you can figure out how to get it as accurate as you can for the wood that you're using and the height of the box that you're making and getting the flipping and stuff. Look, just be creative, have a play around. You might actually find ways to create wider gaps by moving at smaller amounts or offsetting them. There's a lot of creativity, a lot of fun you can have with these. You can pick up these Torcata box joint router bits from Timbercon at timbercon.com.au or you can click on the link below. Otherwise, if you're in Perth and Melbourne, just drop into one of the stores.